That is why today we are announcing a three-year pause on the federal pollution price on heating oil so that we can give everyone the time and ability to switch to heat pumps. That moment right there, that might be the moment that Canadians realized it was pretty much over for the Trudeau government. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau standing in front of his Atlantic Canadian Liberal MPs and saying with a straight face that he was pausing the carbon tax on home heating oil and claiming that this was about fighting climate change and not just a brazen attempt to save his political fortunes. Hello and welcome to the Full Comment Podcast. I'm Brian Lilly, your host, and today we're talking about the state of the Trudeau government. It's been a tough few months for them in the polls, but the last few weeks in particular have been really tough on them. It's one of the hardest falls I've seen in my near quarter century of covering politics. So one of the questions is, can they recover? Is there someone to take over if Trudeau decides it's time to leave? And what about Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives? Chris Selly is a political columnist with the National Post. He spent decades covering the political ups and downs of politicians of all stripes. He's seen governments come and go, and some even rescue themselves from seeming oblivion. He seemed like the right guest to have on this week to take a political temperature check and to survey the state of the Fair Dominion. I got to say, the last couple of weeks for the Trudeau Liberals have been one of the most disastrous things I've ever watched in politics. And I've seen governments fall apart. We, you know, I'm, I'm, I wasn't covering it, but I'm old enough to remember the uh, Mulroney uh, or Kim Campbell mm-hmm. conservatives going down to two seats. But this is a very rapid decline for them, wouldn't you say? It's a rapid decline brought on, as you say, by them just turning tail on some of their, well, carbon tax, their central environmental policy. Um, you can't, I mean, the whole point of a carbon tax is supposed to be that it's simple and that you don't have car- carve-outs. You don't have special deals for special industries. Now, Canada is a big country. You, you pretty much have to have uh, allowances for people who live in rural areas as opposed to urban areas but this and, is and a, they've got a, a an increased rebate for and that's right and already. so that that does account and and they're doubling that across the country so that is something for everyone but they were making it very clear that this was a a, a means of helping people in atlantic canada canada specifically because more atlantic canadians use uh home heating oil than anywhere else in the province and it's it's ridiculous. It's it it you know only a month ago you had Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo saying you know how ridiculous would it look if we carved out things for different parts of the province? I mean it just wouldn't work that way. And then they went because, and did it because for that long Atlantic Liberal MPs have been going to their party and saying you have to do something or this is going to kill us. Exactly, exactly. And and so you know I'm barely even seeing anyone in media or anywhere else even giving the benefit of the doubt that this is sort of in any way. I mean, it's helped for Atlantic Canadians for sure, but it's, it's a political move. Um, and, and, and after seven years or eight years of them telling you that this is, that, that this, this is what we need to do our part to save the planet. Uh, and now they go and, and just torpedo the whole idea of a carbon tax. And for what? I mean, why would you vote for the party that's going to take the, the carbon tax off home heating oil for three years? presumably bringing it back afterwards when you could vote for the party that's going to get rid of it altogether. And and when they bring it back after the three year pause, they will have increased it three times. Yeah. Presumably. Yeah. Because it goes up every April 1st or July 1st. I can't remember which, which time of the year the carbon tax goes up, but it's um, it's remarkable. The line I've been using is this was all done because Justin Trudeau's support in Atlantic Canada was melting faster than the polarized caps. That red wall in Atlantic Canada that surprised many, myself included. In 2015, I thought he would do well in Atlantic Canada. Yeah, I didn't think he would sweep the way he did. And that formed the basis of his majority government. He still got 24 out of 32 seats in Atlantic Canada. But every poll is showing he's going to be just about wiped out one seat, some projections say, in Newfoundland yeah. out of seven. Uh, about four in New Brunswick could be wiped out in Nova Scotia and PEI. That's a significant drop, and there's no way that he can form government without that. So do the voters in Atlantic Canada turn around and say, well, sure, it's craven politics, but it helps my pocketbook, so I'll do, I'll take it? 
Yeah. Well, look, Craven politics is look, you, you got to go out there and fight for your best interest, uh, in, in politics. And they've successfully done that. The Atlantic caucus has successfully done that, but that doesn't mean it's going to save their bacon. I mean, there's, there's you and I've seen all co- sorts of governments do last, you know, Hail Mary passes at the end of the day, throwing out, <laughs> you know, policies that they, that they held dear. It doesn't usually work because at the end of the day, you look ridiculous. And especially if there's, another party that's offering you the same relief or better, you know, Atlantic Canadians have proven themselves swing voters and that's, it helps. <laughs> it helps when you want to get things done in Ottawa. The, the announcement that Trudeau made, um, it's not lost on me that he made it as Pierre Polyev, the conservative leader was flying to Windsor, Nova Scotia, middle of the riding of King's hands. Scott Bryson's all writing. Remember the, you know, everything bad it happened to the Trudeau liberals at one point with Scott Bryson involved. <laughs> right, yeah. uh, but he, uh, you know, he held that writing and, and the liberals have held it for 20 years. That's a long time. Pierre Polly have had a thousand people out in on a Thursday night in October with no election on. Yeah. That's, you know, when I've covered election campaigns i have not seen it you know it's not not easy to get a thousand people out at the height that's of right. a contested election campaign and we're t- and we're potentially two years out you know we're not just right in the middle of it we're not just not in an election campaign it could potentially be ages and if i'm the liberals i don't know why why well, I, I mean i don't know what what you're planning at this point i mean you don't want an election now i guess you hang on as long as you can if if that's justin trudeau's uh, if that's what he wants to do, if he just wants to stay prime minister. But, you know, I guess the bright side for the liberals is there's two, two years to turn things around. But then you wonder what could possibly, what would that be? Um, I guess every two week period can't be as terrible as the last two, two weeks. Yeah. The last few weeks have been um, really bad. I, I do want to point out, I believe, uh, both National Post and Toronto Sun had news of this poll over the last few days. The latest Leger numbers showed that, um, not only were the Conservatives ahead on the national numbers at 40% support, but in Atlantic Canada, they had 46% support. And that was in a poll taken the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday after Trudeau's big announcement, which, of course, was all the news in Atlantic Canada. Yeah. And this is with Pierre Polyev. I mean, let's not forget how long, how recently people were saying, oh, no, I mean, Pierre Polyev is a terrible choice. You know, he's unlikable. People won't, people won't caught on to him people won't uh like his his attitude i mean I, <laughs> either i mean i think he's found something that he didn't have before in terms of his his presentation um but <sighs> this this is this is justin trudeau to me this is this is like this is like when doug ford you know doug ford versus christine elliott for the pc leadership here in ontario that was really the, the race to be the next premier and that was the race with with the conservatives federally, I think. But I, I'm impressed with Polyev. I, I never thought I'd see him <laughs> in the 40s. I thought he would. I thought he could become prime minister, you know, with a mid 30s um, results with with a minority. But this is really spectacular to see. And he's well, he, he's over delivering, I would say, right now. Um, and the question is, can he keep it? The back in the end of May. There were a lot of polls that still had the uh, the conservatives and the liberals tied. I think there was a Leger poll then, and it had them. I think it was effectively tied, thirty three for the the conservatives, thirty one for the liberals, which would have given us pretty much the parliament yeah. that we have now. Now, the seat projections would say over two hundred seats for the conservatives, and you know, the, on, on Monday. They're going to have this vote to, um, you know, for Polyev's motion that says you've got to either expand the home heating oil uh, tax break for everyone on the carbon tax. Uh, you've got to expand it to people who use natural gas, propane, what have you. Or liberal and NDP MPs have to stand up and say, oh, no, we won't do that. So they're kind of between a, a rock and a hard place. And, and, and folks are going to notice. If, if, if you're one of 76 liberal MPs in Ontario where almost everyone uses natural gas, how do you turn around and say to your voters, yeah, you just, 
we don't care enough. About yeah, that. natural gas, which is what thirty percent cleaner in terms of emissions mm-hmm. than home heating oil. Which so there's no way to sell this <laughs> at all. I, I mean, you'd have been better off sticking with home heating oil uh, under un, under this plan, and that's just it. It you know, I, I feel like they killed the carbon tax dead in a stroke um doing that i don't see how how as you say how can they possibly stand up in the house of commons and tell someone who's burning cleaner cleaner fuel to heat their home that that they're not entitled to something who's down the down the block someone's burning dirtier fuel i mean the whole idea of the carbon tax is that it should be incentivizing that person with the dirty fuel to get the cleaner fuel and now they're rewarding well they're not rewarding people i mean atlantic canada like you can't just flip a switch and and have a heat pump or have a or switch to natural gas or well apparently we're going to flip this way well, and in three years install thousands upon thousands of heat pumps that may or may not we may not have enough of the manufactured may not have enough skilled tradespeople to install them and there's questions about whether they will work in the colder parts of the country yeah well those are the sorts of things that i i don't think this government really thinks that far in advance. I mean, he, the, the, the announcement, like I've been saying for a while, like the announcement is the policy. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, we're going to come out and we're going to say something and it may or may not happen down the line, but we just want to get through the day here without having too much crap fall down on our heads. And that's what, that that's what they did for that one day. Uh, and they, you know, probably, there's probably some liberal voters in uh, Atlantic Canada who think, oh, thank God, like, all right, now I can go back to my safety vote and I get some money off my home heating. But everyone else, why? Why, why would I? Well, I mean, the NDP is is has always called for you know to 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 exempt um, home heating from certainly the GST. I'm not sure the, about the, the carbon GST, tax. Yeah, no, not the carbon tax. Um, but you know, th- there's other options for you out there if you want to save money on, on your on on your home heating and i just don't understand and then and then you know other things that the liberals are doing recently you know smart relatively smart things i think you know you got new housing minister sean fraser who's who's putting the screws to municipalities that won't uh approve dense enough developments but i mean that's that was a pierre polyev idea and not originally but he he was the one who popularized it just recently and everyone all liberals saying oh, that won't work it's ridiculous we need to work with municipalities you know we need to convene and, and, and well, we need to, and we need to be friendly with everyone. And then suddenly you got Sean Fraser sending off a, a, a barbed letter to, to the mayor of Calgary saying, no, we're not going to, we're not going to approve this. Um, we're not going to approve this, this development. We're not going to fund this development unless you make it denser. So uh, let's just do an aside on that. Um, yeah, some good policies in there, but they're going about doing it in a way what you just described. The announcement is the policy. They're going city by city. Uh, yeah. 444 yeah, municipalities right, yeah. just in Ontario. They could have gone to the provinces. Mm-hmm. And Ontario has just gone through a legislative process. British Columbia did to do densification. And that includes saying, as of right, you can build three homes on what used to be considered a single right. family dwelling lot. The provincial government in Ontario went with three because too many municipalities balked at four. And they said, well, you know, three works in some, four would work in some, but not others. So they did that. They could have just gone to the province and said, make it four and we'll give you extra money and you can help us distribute it. Yeah. But you don't get as many photo ops. No. You don't get to go out with every single announcement. And so they, you know, they, they could have worked with British Columbia and they could have worked with Ontario, the two places where this is the biggest issue. Yeah. But, mm, well, they're not liberals, so we won't work with them. Yeah. It's uh, it it is a government that just seems to be uh, flailing at at every turn. Now you you've got this two environmental conferences going on in Ottawa, in the days after this carbon tax announcement. You've got Catherine McKenna, <laughs> and future Liberal leader Mark Carney, uh, <laughs> both criticizing it. Yeah. Uh, well, of course they are. But you've got, <laughs> how can you not criticize it? It's it's just a complete abdication of the whole idea of a carbon tax. But you've had you've got. Percy Down and Lawrence Martin both recently coming out with columns saying that Justin Trudeau's got to go. Now, Percy Down is, you know, unless you're a real political wonk, you're not going to know who he is. But he's a big deal in liberal circles. Yes. He was Jean Chrétien's chief of staff mm-hmm. for a time. He was a liberal senator for years. And Lawrence Martin, you know, Globe columnist who's not been unfriendly to the Trudeau liberals. To say the least. And 
for them to both come out and say, this guy's time's up. That's significant. It's significant, except who, <laughs> except who replaces him. I mean, yeah, it's, it's quite clear that his time is up, but someone's got to be a liberal leader. And I mean, who wants to donate their body to that cause? I mean, I mean, you know, the, there are, there's only so many Kathleen wins in the world, right? I mean, that was a, that was a, uh, a clapped out government here in Ontario that Kathleen Wynne came in and she's a great campaigner and she, you know, she pulled it out of the fire. There's not many people that can do that. And I look at the, and, and she did that in 2014, but not 2018. No, no, that's right. Well, and then, and then, you know, the Ontario liberals have to look at that and say, did we accomplish anything in those four years that is worth the oblivion that we now live in? <laughs> there, there are many in Ontario, the liberals who were in power for 15 years, are now the minivan party. Yeah, they can all commute to work together. That's right. And the liberals have, you know, I don't think the federal liberals are ever going to, you know, they they hit bottom with Ignati. If uh, I, I think that's probably their floor. I don't think they're going to get wiped out to, to three or four seats. But but they're not supposed to. Like there's, <laughs> you know, this is this is an incredible brand that Justin Trudeau is driving into the ditch here. Um. Let, let me ask you about that then, uh, because part of Percy Downs' letter was talking about how the liberals need to get back to the center. And there are still liberals out there who talk as if this is a centrist party. They haven't noticed that this is not a centrist party. This is not your grandfather's or your father's or your uncle's liberal party anymore. This is the party of Justin Trudeau. In fact, he, he, he even calls it a movement. He doesn't call it a party. It's, it, it's a movement built around him. They got rid of membership fees. So yep. like I'm probably considered part of the movement because as any smart journalist, I've signed up for their mailing list. All they need is your email and you're part of their movement. Yep. Um, I'm sure, you know, you're you probably on. don't even have to sign up. It'll probably just arrive. <laughs> yeah. So you and I are likely members of this movement. That yeah. I don't know about you, but I have no intention of voting for. And they, they, they've just built it all around Trudeau. And now his brand is falling apart. I, I think that's exactly right. I think it's, it's not a left right thing. It's a Trudeau thing. Like Trudeau. Yeah. I, I, I think he's probably to the left of your your average liberal, liberal government over the, over the decades. But I don't think there's anything co like, it's not like he's, a, he's a coherent leftist or a coherent ideologue of any sort. I just think it's just a mess of preferences and, and weird ideas pinging around his, his head. And there's no one who seems to be in charge who has any ability to sort of, I mean, this has always been true. Like whether he's going on vacation on the Aga Khan's Island or saying some stupid stuff about canoe storage, like this is just, as you say, it's all him. He does what he seems to do what he wants, even when it seems to be an absolutely terrible idea. Um, and now they're paying the price. All they can do is, is just try and give people what they want. Um, you know, say, so Oh, we're listening after we're going to do all these things that you need after eight years when the opposition parties are promising them as well. I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I, I if, if I was liberal, I would probably want a new leader too. But I, as I say, I just can't imagine who would want to do that to their resume, to, to be the person who finally, um, the next Michael Ignatieff. I mean, that's no one, that's not anything to aspire to. You know, there's obviously uh, ambitious people in the party and there's been a lot of talk of Christian Freeland. Some people see her as a savior. I don't know why. I don't know why either. Um, I, I, I'm not, I, she's a she's a very intelligent, accomplished person, but I don't I don't think she's a very good politician. No. So I don't see her translating to retail politics on a national no. level when she speaks to adults like she's uh, reading a bedtime story. Well, that's right. She's never had to. She's never contested. She's never even contested a tough riding, right? Which is more than less than you can say about Justin Trudeau. I mean. Trudeau went into a tough riding, a tough riding and won and, and, and paid his dues in that respect because the party wasn't willing to lay out the, the um, sort of the red carpet for him, which was in hindsight probably a pretty good instinct. I mean, I always go back, like you remember when b before Justin Tr Trudeau took over and, and they were in the, in the, in the dumps and they had however many ridiculous number of seats and they were like, well, we're going to, we're going to renew, we're going to have a new Kingston conference. We're going to get all these smart people together and we're going to decide what the liberal party of Canada really stands for. Oh, Justin's in, forget it. 
it's done. It's done. We're gonna win. We're gonna win. We're gonna win. That's what we want. That's what we like. We like winning. And Justin Trudeau's gonna win for us. And when he leaves, they're gonna be just as untethered from any kind of, you know, what is this party? What is it? But, but I, I think I, someone like Frankie Bubbles, uh, or industry minister, is that what he is now? Um, Francois Philippe Champagne, of course, I'm talking about it going Frankie yeah, yeah. Bubbles. He, uh, you know, he's more of an old fashioned business liberal. I'm not going to call him a blue liberal because I, I don't think he is, but he, but he's a business oriented liberal. Uh, I don't know that the party would accept a guy like that now. It's, you know, has the party changed and morphed? Do they expect that you're just going to, without thinking, adopt the latest cause and change your Twitter avatar uh, to reflect that you're now with the current thing? Well, I feel like that wave may be kind of cresting. I don't know. Like, in terms of what people, I hate I hate the word woke, but it does paint a picture <laughs> of, of what we're talking about here. I feel like that's that that horrible sort of performative Twitter garbage that that Trudeau and his his gang are so dedicated to. Um, I feel like that's less of a thing. I'm not. I don't know. It's just it's just a feeling. Like I feel like people just aren't buying that anymore. And I think Champagne would be is an, would be an interesting choice. Quite apart from you know where whether he's blue or red or, or whether the party would accept it. But to me, that's like he's boring. That's kind of almost what I would want if I was a liberal. Like, I don't want another cult of personality. I don't want, I want like a manager and someone that voters might just say, well, you know, maybe they don't like Pierre Polyev, but they, they couldn't stand Justin Trudeau. And here's this relatively inoffensive guy in a suit uh, and regular socks uh, who doesn't tweet that often and maybe that's what but i don't know i mean we're i'm we're just stabbing in the i'm just stabbing in the dark here and i don't even have any skin in the game you uh, you mentioned the socks thing and i laughed and of course um it's funny it, liberals now get angry when uh they uh you know somebody brings up socks but that was something that they used for their branding to start with and then when it you know started to be the butt of jokes then they became mm, no yeah, we we don't want to talk about socks anymore. Yeah, well, I mean, it, look, you look back at at the early days of Trudeau, and you look at some of the things that were written about him and how he would, you know, rescue the new world order from. I mean, it's just what the hell? Like, what were people thinking? You know, I looked at the guy and saw just just I don't want to be too insulting about it, but like just a regular politician, average politician with a famous last name. Like why anyone thought that this guy, when then you listen to him talk with his, you know, his weird, this mixture of sort of old time religion, like peacekeeping and, and, uh, which we never got back to, which we never, well, we went to Mali for like a year and then scampered out of there. The with UN, a very small operation. With a very small operation. And the UN was like, could you please stay? And we're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, this is dangerous here. We don't. Want yeah, whoa, dangerous. whoa! Like that's. Don't you understand the reason we're into peacekeeping is because we don't want to like put ourselves in danger. Like this, this is this is this has always been the scam. Um, and you know, it's his sort of when you look back at the beginning, like he's talking about whipping out your CF, CF 18s You know, he's against he did, admiring China. Just he's just said all this bizarre stuff, and it just it, no one noticed. And to me. I mean, I've written a, a few times over the years. Just I, like he's weird, like he's a weird guy. Like he, he he has weird instincts, and he says strange things. And for a while, people just applauded. And now I, I don't know how you get that back, right? Like there's no, you know, S Stephen Harper was was uh, disliked um, by a lot of people in the same way Trudeau was, but he didn't. It, 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 people weren't people were never crazy about Stephen Harper. There was no Harper mania. Um, there was Trudeau mania. You can't get get that back. It's just I don't understand. I I don't know, and that's why I guess I sort of think maybe a new leader is the only path. Because how can they? What's going to happen over the next two years? I guess anything could happen over the next two years, but I don't see what what could possibly rescue them. Um, you know, unless something horrible happens to to the opposition, it's 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 a it's an incredible situation. But we have to realize it is only just a couple of weeks. Um, you know, 
in a year, some horrible other thing might have happened. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in six, six months of polling have shown steady growth of conservatives. Yes. But as I'd like to point out, voters are fickle and things can change and we're a ways off. Uh, let's take a, a, a break here. And when we come back, I want to ask you what Trudeau's legacy, you know, if he leaves now or he's defeated in the next election or what have you, do, does he have a, a solid legislative or managerial record that he can point to? And, and we'll kick around a little bit about what Polyev has to do to, to try and win more when we're uh, more when we're back. So let's say Justin Trudeau does decide to take the proverbial walk in the snow or the surfboard to Tofino or whatever analogy you want to make. Let's say he does that. What kind of legacy does he leave? I remember an editor before the 2019 election, I think it was summer of 2018, they asked me to go through Trudeau's first three or so years and look at his legislative record and see if he'd accomplished anything. And at that point, he had boosted the Canada Child Benefit, which was started by Stephen Harper. They like to claim that, you know, they they invented it. He increased it and he made pot legal. And that was really it. Um, has he done much since the carbon tax, obviously a signature policy that he's now killing. Yeah. But what would you look at Trudeau's legacy and say that that's what he did? Well, I think if you, if you talk about the child benefit, I mean, I would say one of the things is poverty rates fell and child, child poverty rates specifically fell quite dramatically under, uh, under his watch. Now, they were already historically low. They were already historically low. And I'm not saying that Justin Trudeau waved a magic legislative wand and made that happen. But, you know, um, prime ministers always take credit for good things that happen under their watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think that's something that he can legitimately point to. I think legalizing marijuana was a, a good idea. Uh, still a good idea. I'm really surprised they did it, to be honest. That was one of the things that I saw that I thought was going to you know, I, I thought along with electoral reform, that was just going to fall off because someone would just say, oh, it's too hard. You know, just like they always said, Washington will never let us do it. And then we did it and Washington never, <laughs> never uh, made a peep about it, really. So I, I think that's a, you know, it's, it's hard. It's not earth shattering. Um, but I think it was a, it was an interesting thing to do. Canada doesn't usually lead the way on things like that unless the courts order us to made. Uh, yeah. Euthanasia or, uh, same-sex marriage, you know, the liberals had to take credit for that. But, you know, until the courts said they had to do it, they were firmly against same-sex marriage. Um, you know, I, I think they've managed the Trump um, four years, the first four years anyway, pretty well. We'll see about the next four. Yeah, yeah, was, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe. Um, uh, but okay, I'll... tough to deal with a tough to deal with a president when he's in prison. But yeah, like I. Well, I'll quibble with you on that because sure, you could quibble with any of these things. I'm saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but but let let's talk about it. But with Trump, they you know, had to go into the NAFTA renegotiations, and we had this um, this document was put out on what our priorities were. And it was like five priorities, and it was gender and the environment and stuff like that. The Americans had a multi-page thing. They're they're required by law to say what their trade uh, priorities Mm -hmm. and goals are when they're negotiating a deal like this. It was all about more access for their manufacturers, for their businesses, for their services. And we were like, well, we'd like gender equality. Yeah. Well, okay, who's against that? That's a solid quibble, yeah. Yeah. No. Well, then why would you waste... Yeah, who's against that? Why would you waste... If I'm the Americans, it's like, fine, have gender equality. Have gender equality. Is this? Are you actually negotiating (laughs) on this? Like, fine, have it. But, but we'll, we want something in re- return. We're yeah. going to take your auto industry. Yeah, and we want we want access to your dairy industry. Um, fat chance. Um, yeah, no, I, any of these things could could be quibbled with. And and you know that's not to say that another government would have done terribly with with Trump. Um, but I, I just think, you know, there were a lot of predictions of of doom. Is all I'm saying, and I, I think mm-hmm. they did a reasonable job on that. I think you could argue. I think it's definitely out. It is definitely an open question. I think he, the things he did with the Senate, um, I'm not quite sure what my verdict is on that in terms of uh, all these independent senators and kicking all the senators out of caucus. But I don't think it was, 
I don't think it was a conspicuously bad idea. I think if you're going to have a Senate, more independence is better uh, than less independence in terms of actually getting um, sober second thought, as they always say. I think senators have done some good work. Um, (laughs) The the, the Senate has changed dramatically over the last few decades. It's no longer the place where people sit, sleep, and drool uh, (laughs) while the, the place is in session. It hasn't been in a long time. So, you know, all, all I would say is I, if, if he's going to call it an independent Senate, I'd like him to appoint a few people that don't think exactly like he does. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly. Uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the independent senators he appoints could certainly be also called liberal senators. Um, it, it was a little while ago, but one of the um, media outlets that a uh, um, a look at the votes and found that the independent Senate caucus voted more with the liberal government than the liberal senators did previously. Well, the problem, of course, is that is that you know the Senate can can go around and point out problems with legislation, but and I think that's useful if you're going to have a Senate. But then I also don't want them to ever vote down <laughs> uh, vote down legislation that that you know they're they're not elected at the end of the day. Um, but if they send back a, a piece of legislation and say, here's problems to fix. And they've done that. And then that's on, good. On some good, on some good files. I mean, one random one that comes to mind was when they legalized marijuana, they implemented these draconian, uh, new rules that now a cop can stop you without any cause whatsoever and stick a breathalyzer in your mouth. Um, you can theoretically be arrested after you, you like they can come into your house and arrest you if someone says that they've been. That, that, that you've been drinking. And these were just, you know, they were over the top pieces of legislation and the Senate tore, tore them apart. Then it passed anyways. Um, I think the Senate's done good work on, on, on euthanasia, although they recommended the, the, uh, mental illness thing. So I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't, th- I, I don't think it's a strong legacy, whatever Trudeau has. Um, I mean, you can't say at the end of it though, um, the Canada's back. No, you certainly can't say the Canada's back. I mean, on the on the world stage, I mean, his legacy is maybe is maybe Canadians finally realizing how useless we are. But but uh, okay, and I've heard that a lot recently, especially after you know the the India debacle, after the uh, the fact that we weren't included on the call to deal with. Israel and the war against Hamas in, in the immediate aftermath of the terrorist attacks, and and people say, "Well, we're, you know, we're look, we're not big anyway." And I think back to the two thousand eight two thousand nine financial crisis. Stephen Harper was the prime minister. Jim Flaherty was his finance minister. Future Liberal leader Mark Carney was the Bank of Canada governor. All three of them chaired different committees at the G twenty dealing with the global financial crisis. Canada was sought out for advice. I can't see that happening ever at the current moment. No, I. I mean, we, we don't have anything to offer. Uh, <laughs> Trudeau's answer when a journalist asked him after the uh, the G twenty in uh, in Delhi was like, "Well, what did Canada offer to the communique?" He literally said, "Gendered language." I mean, he offered that up, and and again. There's nothing wrong with pushing for gender equality, but, you know, no wonder we weren't on the call two weeks later yeah. dealing with Israel. Well, should we call Canada? No, no, we're in war. We don't need gender yeah, language. Yeah, we don't need gender language. I mean, that that's, and, and that's one of the, they're so, he and his brain trusts are so dedicated to that symbolic stuff that nothing concrete gets done, I feel like. Uh, to to them, that is actually an accomplishment. Uh, better language on gender. The language is is is, you know, they, they always take the path of least resistance. I mean, this is a man who admitted admitted to to presiding over an ongoing genocide, and then nothing happened, and he didn't expect to have any consequences. Just yeah, all right, fine. It's, I, I I just think that. It's it's so performative, the whole government, and I think it drags the good ministers in in his cabinet down. 
uh, which is why I would want a new leader. But again, who is it? Uh, I mean, it's okay. In the commercial break, our producer Andre got in my ear and was saying, is there really no one that can pull it back from the brink and pointed out that something you had said earlier that in 2014 or 2013, when she took over, Kathleen Wynne inherited an Ontario Liberal Party that had been in power close to a decade and was looking rough. And Very it was rough. a minority government. She turned around and got a majority government. Now, partly that was due to the ineptitude of the people running Tim Hudak's campaign. Uh, they announced a policy to fire 100,000 civil servants. I was about to say, was that the firing 100,000 civil servants election? Yeah. Or yep. was it the chain gangs election? <laughs> that was the previous one. So, um, you know, sometimes it's your, your opposition. Is there anybody that you see that could turn things around? I, I don't think. Well, what Kathleen went up to? No, I'm joking. <laughs> I, I don't think Anita Anand, who's also been floated, is someone who's got that retail politics. Well, that's thing. it. If, 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 if there's, if there's a win analogy waiting in, waiting in the wings somewhere, she's a, she or he is a very, very good campaigner, first and foremost. The people we've been talking about are, are, are not so far as we know. Um, I mean, I, 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 I am struggling here, uh, to think of anyone in the current liberal caucus who has that sort of, uh, ability and who isn't also tied in people's minds to Trudeau. Like who the, you know, they see Seamus O'Regan would be a silly idea, but you know, you look at him and people see Justin Trudeau, I think. Um, man, there might be someone out there. Uh, Pierre Polyev is not going to do anything as stupid as Tim Hudak did, I don't think. But he, he's got two years to step in it and, and politicians often do. And politicians yeah. often do. Yeah. Let me ask you about Polyev then. Uh, you said earlier that you didn't think he would do that well. I'm not sure if you said you, you weren't a fan of his. But I'll say that now. <laughs> you're not a fan. I, 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 I haven't been in the past. I mean, I associate with him, you know, when I think of him, and I think certain people of a certain age uh, think of him as that 20-something pit bull in the House of Commons who would say anything, uh, you know, if, whatever the most ridiculous talking point they wanted to put out there, they would have Pierre Pauly have a deliver, and he would do it with gusto, and, and it just... He just rubbed me the wrong way as an ultra partisan um, person. I think now he uh, he talks differently. Um, he chews apples while he talks. He, ch- he chews apples. I mean, that was a remarkably effective. Now, obviously, liberals saw that and seethed with hatred. But I mean, as someone who has not been a fan of him, like that, I was like, see, that's a natural, unscripted. Uh, yeah, it's, it's combative, but rightfully combative. Well, the, the journalist and, showed up and was asking the most oh. loaded questions that uh, you and I have been in the business for a long time. I don't know about you, but I've asked dumb questions my editors have sent me with, and I learned quickly not to do that. I remember Lucien Bouchard, Quebec premier, making me feel an inch tall <laughs> because I asked a ridiculous loaded question that my editor had sent. And I said, I'm never doing that again. I'm going to learn. This guy, he's experienced. I think he is the editor. Oh, he is. And, yeah, he's the sort of sole proprietor, I think, almost and, of this. Uh, and, and was just asking the most loaded questions. So, yeah, of course, rightfully combative. Yeah, and and, and it's not the first time um, that Polyev has faced that. So, sort of like, well, given that, you know, given that you're like Donald Trump, what do you think was just, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, there's nobody in Canadian politics that's like Donald Trump. Trump. There's very few people in American politics or, or anything like Donald Trump. Um, yeah, I, I think he has impressed me just with being able to take it, finding a, a, another register, I think, just sounding more serious. He's clearly, you know, it doesn't matter, uh, uh, what I think. I live in Toronto Center. Um, I, but I think, you know, he's, you and me both and it, our votes, <laughs> our votes don't count for a whole lot, right? Now. He's certainly, um, I mean, the numbers of, uh, younger voters supporting him still every time I see it just boggles me. It doesn't boggle my mind. I understand completely. He's talking about housing and that's the number one issue for, um, for younger Canadians, but it's, it's boggling the liberals minds clearly that, that this is, that this is working. But I think it's, 
it's 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 impressive because it's especially impressive because he he had so many negatives baked in. Like if you looked at, I can't remember who did this polling, but there was someone compared like how many people had firm opinions about Aaron O'Toole when he took over and Andrew Shear when he took over and Stephen Harper when he took over, and Pierre Polyev had was far more known than any of them were at the time that he took over the party and far more negatively known. And he's, he's worked uh, hard to, to switch that. And it's, it's clearly worked. People may not love him, but they're clearly willing to vote for him. And that's all that matters. Well, let let me give you some numbers because one of the things that we kept hearing was women, especially don't like that's another one. Yeah. Right now there's Leger poll that I mentioned earlier that has them at 40% nationally and leading in every single region except Quebec, um, and leading handily in every single region except Quebec. Well, 36% of women say they would vote for uh, Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives, compared to 27% for Trudeau and the Liberals, and 21% for Singh and the NDP. Oh, it's a poor NDP. 18 to 34 the Liberals are in third. It's 38% for the Conservatives, 26% for the NDP, 21% for the Liberals. And uh, the numbers don't get any better for the Trudeau Liberals. Um, you know, they're, they're down to their core support of, uh, of women 55 plus. Yeah. The retired civil servants, you know, Alice, who used to work at the hospital, and uh, Kim, the uh, retired teacher. That's that's their voting base at this point. Well, they had a they had a, they put an ad on Twitter I think last week, where it was sort of <laughs> it was it was going after Stephen Harper for uh, for raising the retirement age, and it's like we'll and they're like we'll always have your back because we lowered it, and it's like every, but everyone that's that was a dumb thing to do. Like Stephen Harper took a bullet for future governments in doing that, right? It was a, it was a politically unpopular thing to do. But a, a smart thing to do, and then the liberals undid it. And now they're trying to boast about it. Well, as you say, if you're if if you're 62 uh, and you're looking to retire, which is sort of the core base, the liberals' core base now, yeah. <laughs> that's good news. But what are other people saying? I mean, young people look at that; they know they're not retiring at 65. Uh, I mean, they just don't seem to know. They seem I'm to... over 50, and I don't see myself retiring. At no, 65. indeed, yeah, and, and it's like. I mean, there's, there's always people joke. It's become a joke, right? Like how <laughs> liberals think that they have communications problems, right? There was, it becomes sort of a running joke. Like, no, you don't have communications problems. You have governing problems, but they also have communications problems. Like they can't keep, it's kind of the point where they can't keep a story straight. Like with this, with this climate change, with the carbon tax announcement, you, you had, if you look, if you look at a uh, Goody Hutchings, Twitter account. This is the Minister for Rural Economic Development. You'll see she's got one tweet, and it sort of says, um, "We're you know raising, we're we're making life easier for people nationwide." You know, this isn't a regional announcement. And then the tweet one below says, "We're making life more affordable in Atlantic Canada with this announcement," which everyone knows is exactly what they're doing. But you're not supposed to say it out loud. <laughs> I mean, they just, I don't know. Like it almost looks sometimes like they've given up. So. Do you think Canadians are willing to, I mean, right now the polls say, yeah, they would back the Conservatives. But as we've discussed, election could be as much as two years away. Um, and the Liberals are turning now and, and they're attacking them, saying, oh, uh, th- these guys will cut. Or en français the other day, uh, one of the ministers was, chop, 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 she said in the, uh, in the House of Commons. You, you've got them going after the fact that probably I was saying, common sense conservatives and they're saying well we saw what happened when there were common sense conservatives in ontario you had walkered it no that was you know two guys that drank a lot on a friday afternoon and didn't do their job also it was 25 years ago i mean or longer no longer like like who i mean i'm picturing a 28 year old voter saying like who the hell's mike harris (laughs) like why are you talking about this who's stephen harper for that matter for some of these voters i mean they, they just yeah like like that stuff, I mean, that's just, you know, that's old time liberal religion, right? You just show a picture of Mike Harris and everyone's, whoa, where do I vote? Where do I vote? Um, yeah. Do, do these boogeymen work though with, 
with abortion. Well, they guns. have worked, but but will they work this time? I mean, you look at their uh, their latest move on the gun ban issue. They said on yeah. May well, there's 1st, another example of them. Yeah, May first, twenty twenty, they announced they're going to ban all these guns and they'll develop a buyback program. It's you know, as we record today, it's November second, twenty twenty three. They haven't bought back a single gun. They don't have a plan to buy back any guns because they don't know how to do it. Yeah. And they've extended the exemption until October 30th, 2025. So five and a half years after they said these guns are too dangerous to exist, we must you know, confiscate them. Yeah. The announcement still, is the policy. Again, they're still going to be in the ba- basements and gun safes of your neighbors. I, and, and I mean, I think. I mean, Polyev is interesting, right? Because every now and again, you see them try to sort of, or you see liberals. I'm not, I'm not sure about the liberal. I'm trying to think if I've seen the liberal party go after him as sort of a social conservative, because he really isn't. No, like that's the problem, right? I mean, Andrew Scheer was probably the most socially conservative, outwardly socially conservative leader you've seen in federal politics recently since Stock Day. Since Stock with it, yeah, that's true. Um, like I, I just I don't think there's anything there. Like if if it, you know he gave a a, a really interesting inter- interview. It was in French, not by accident, uh, about how he changed his mind on same sex marriage. Um, but I mean, who cares? Who's same-sex- voting on that these days. Exactly. It's done. It's 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 a thing. Like um, and and like there's nobody voting for the conservatives to have them reverse same sex marriage. No. If 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 that's what you're voting on, you haven't voted for the conservatives in 20 years. Yeah, or you're a glutton for punishment, which, <laughs> frankly, a lot of Canadian social conservatives seem to be, um, in terms of supporting the the conservatives, and they never get anything. <laughs> I, I, I think the the most that they would say about Stephen Harper is he didn't make things worse. Yeah, well, and that's not. I mean, you know, that's part of the reason people vote conservative is to just, <laughs> to just stop, you know. Uh, a conservative government might be seen not to have done that many things, but that's kind of part of being conservative is conserving uh, the good things you have and, and not messing around with them. Um, totally so Polyev, Polyev, does d- does he keep going or does he step in it? It's it's, it's tough, right? Two years trying to maintain that. Uh trying to maintain where he's at. I don't think I, I see he I, seems to have a really good read on on what people care about and the the things that are working for him, especially housing, are not going to get any better in the next t- 2 years. They're going to get worse. I mean, you look at the number of housing starts we need to solve the problem versus the number of and the housing starts are going down. I mean, it's 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 talk to the developers. It's brutal. Talk to the developers, especially the ones getting beaten up as, um, uh, you know, just uh, jealous or, or uh, greedy um, uh, kleptocrats in Ontario. They, they'll tell you it's the, uh, the the interest rates are are killing the ability of people to buy, the ability of them to build. Um, and so you keep blaming that back on Justin Trudeau. I, I, I would say that if uh, Trudeau's numbers were better, I think he would have tried to go to the polls this fall engineer his own defeat, come up with a reason to call an election. But if the numbers keep looking like this, I don't, you know, I think he'll try and drag it out, uh, you know, uh, and, until he's forced to go to an election because there's no upside at the moment. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine the party would be too happy with him calling an elect- election right now. I mean, <laughs> you're in the 20s, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> like what? Um, and... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's going to be. I, I just I don't know why. I don't know wh- why he wants to be. I mean, I guess why? Why does anyone want to be prime minister? They're, they're ambitious. They have, but I mean, he's been at prime minister for eight years, and and, and he's just spinning his wheels at he, this point. He could walk away at this point and say, "I had a good run." He did have a good run, and and I mean, uh, I I don't know why. You know, I'm not going to bring up his family in, into it, but I mean, you know, it must be pretty pretty exhausting getting beaten up day after day after day in the press and you've got other things to worry about in your life um but i don't know i mean i i i can't put myself in the in the 
in the mind of a prime minister because God knows the things I would have had to do to get there. <laughs> well, Chris, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Great first uh, appearance on full comment. I hope the uh, the audience liked it. They can let us know. They can drop us a line and uh, and argue with us in the comment section. But uh, please, everyone, if you enjoyed the conversation, make sure you're you're sharing this. Full comment is a post media podcast. My name's Brian Lilly, your host. This episode was produced by Andre Prue with theme music by Bryce Hall. Kevin Libin is the executive producer. You can subscribe to Full Comment on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Amazon Music, etc. You can listen through the app or your Alexa-enabled devices. And, of course, you can help us out by giving us a rating or leaving a review. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Brian Lilly.